All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, returning to your seats. And we'll get going on the next session. As I mentioned, uh, we're looking forward to directions that Pierre might be uh, going. Uh, I think everything that we will see today is uh, consistent with uh, our um, approach to mitigating earthquake risk. But uh, I thought that uh, we would uh, get a number of speakers who might uh, inspire us, but also give us some thoughts uh, that will provoke discussions uh, later today or at lunch or in tomorrow's meetings. The next uh, speaker is going to look at uh, the scenarios that we might have uh, for large earthquakes in uh, uh, the Bay Area, uh, which is representative of California. And um, uh, I have the great pleasure then of introducing Janiel. Uh, Maffei, uh, who is now the Chief Mitigation Officer for the California Earthquake Authority. And uh, she has um, uh, been working with a number of organizations, EERI and, and others, to uh, gather up some of the information she'll be presenting today. But in her new role, uh, she will have some expertise in terms of how the state might respond uh, to earthquakes uh, in terms of insurance and other mechanisms that are available. So uh, with no further ado, Janiel. Well, thank you. Before we start, I wanted to just take a moment, and, and if you don't feel comfortable raising your hand, you could just raise it in your head, but how many of you live in the state of California? All right, University of California is pretty well represented. How about within two kilometers of a type A fault, major fault? Okay, it's whittling down a little bit. How about of the Hayward fault? All right, and how many of you are self-insured? <laughs> well, I'm not here to sell you earthquake insurance today, but I do have a different perspective having joined the California Earthquake Authority in May. So brand new job, very exciting. Um, but in my, my previous life as Janiel Maffei SE, which of course I still am, I did have the opportunity to prepare a document on the Hayward Fault 7.0 magnitude scenario earthquake, um, which is essentially an update of a 1995 document that came from an EERI symposium in 19, as I said, 1995. Um, it was uh, developed by the Northern California chapter of EERI. Uh, you can find it through a link on the EERI uh, website or through the Northern California chapter EERI. So there's a lot of information in there, a lot more detail than I'll go through today. I'll just uh, highlight some of it. But what I'll do is, is when I talk about each individual aspect of this scenario earthquake, I want to do three things. Is I would like to indicate the progress that we've made since 1995, uh, talk about where we need work, which of course translates into potentials for research, and then I would like to, you know, sometimes pose a question, and I won't necessarily have an answer for that, but, um, you know, would like to stimulate conversation and, um, you know, just get, get every, everybody thinking about not only this scenario, but the scenario that, that may affect you, as, as most of you raised your hand. So, um, 1995, the original authors were actually speakers at the conference, including um, Charlie Scothorn is here, I don't know, Mary Camario was one as well, if I'm missing any of you. Um, there were 16 speakers. Uh, fire falling earthquake was not included because, as I understand, the expert, Charlie, was out of town. Uh, but I have included that chapter in, in the update. But I very carefully put into the document um, where we were in 1995 and where we are today for a very important reason is that trajectory is very, very important. It indicates where we're spending money, where we're spending resources, how we're doing, and then it kind of guides you as to where we might be going in the future. So trajectory is extremely important when we talk about the difference and the, uh, the progress that we've made. I did contact the original authors where possible, and they served as editors on the chapters and informed what we were doing, and then there were a lot more um, uh, experts within the field that assisted in the preparation of the document. So we started out with socioeconomic uh, setting, and I think Mary touched on some of these elements. 7.4 million people living within the nine-county San Francisco Bay Area. Very, very dense urban environment, very strong economy. In fact, it's the fourth largest economy in the United States with a $300 billion economy. And of course, we have the Hayward Fault going right through the, um, the East Bay, right through many of these, these nine counties. Um, it's a population with low occupancy travel. We have people uh, commuting throughout this area, getting to their, their jobs, you know, the more than those 7.4 million people working in the area. 
uh, very dense urban environment, and you know, an important economy to the United States and to, to the country as well. Uh, this is a slide that many of you have seen, many of you have used, and I think the important thing with this slide and the important message that we as earthquake professionals need to get out there, particularly about the Hayward Fault scenario, is between the 1906 and today is the, the, the relative calm, the relative, you know, it was a, a re relaxation of stresses in the, the fault, the San Andreas Fault uh, system in the Bay Area. And we've, we've developed, if you think about the post-World War I, the post-World War II development in the San Francisco Bay Area, and, and particularly in the East Bay, that happened during a very relatively quiet time in, in terms of seismic activity. And yet, we all understand that, you know, all of those stresses are building up again and that we expect a period of a very, you know, active um, seismic activity. The, the probabilities for an earthquake in the Bay Area, 62% of a, uh, at least one magnitude, I guess I can read this, 6.7 or greater earthquake, uh, is 62%, I believe it's 31% on the Hayward Fault now within the next 30 years. Very, very important. I think statistically, a, a large earthquake in Southern California actually has a little higher statistical um, probability of happening in the next 30 years, but this is a significant one because it is in a, in a very highly built up region, many, many older buildings that were built to old, older codes. So what did we do? Um, I didn't do this part, but I, I certainly can take credit for um, reporting on it. Fifteen seismologists that were funded by a variety of organizations put together, I think, 35 and chose six scenarios for the Hayward Fault. Uh, they chose the 6.8 magnitude earthquake, the 7.8 magnitude earthquake, and there were um, three epicenters. That, that were within those categories. The one that I used for this particular scenario most carefully, closely matches the one used in 1995, is the 7.0 magnitude with the epicenter in San Pablo Bay rupturing to the south along the full Hayward Fault. So it's a very significant earthquake. And um, as you can see by the, the darker colors, those are um, MMI values on the left-hand side. As I said, for those of us living within two kilometers, we're in the, the uh, I believe it's called extremely violent shaking, or um, uh, 10, maybe as much as 11 if you have very, very bad soil. Uh, and as you move out, you know, we're still for, for quite a distance, and particularly surprisingly out into the Livermore Valley, you know, in MMIs of, of 8 and 9. And you can see that, you know, San Francisco, actually this is not obviously the, the design earthquake, um, but for a great deal of the nine San Francisco Bay Area counties, it's a very significant earthquake. So what have we learned since 1995? Well, there's a lot of things that we knew, but we're able to refine. And part of the reason is because of the advances in technology. Um, you know, in my reporting, I was able to, to, to look at some of the, the information that came from James, James Lane Camper, who, who actually walked the Hayward Fault, produced a, a map that was 10 feet long. And then over the years, um, with Alcris Priola mapping, in order to make sure that you weren't constructing a new building on the fault, you had to trench. And so a lot of what we knew about the Hayward Fault was from these AP trenches, you know, and then, and then from, you know, where you could in fact see the fault, which isn't actually, you know, very much of, of the, the length of the fault. We put together where we thought it was. And then now you look, you know, 1995 to the present at what we are able to do with um, new technology. GPS, obviously, it's an old technology put to good use now. INSAR, LIDAR, uh, these are... Um, technologies where you can look through vegetation and structures and you can start to see the, the, the important things for us, who are, those of us who are trying to map and understand. Also, you can look at uh, pre-earthquake um, movement on the fault, real-time movement, and then, of course, you know, post-earthquake movement on the fault, which is extremely important for all of, of the mapping and all of the, the predictions that we're doing. Um, so, you know, the fault is still there, the geology is the same, but what we understand about it is very, very important. If you think about the olden days with, with you know, where it's just simply a trench, you know, you, you dig a trench, you carbon date the vegetation that's on either side of where you, you think there's a rupture, you get a sense for, for the age of it, and now we're looking at um, a great deal more um, information. And so, you know, in terms of, of where we are and where we, um, you know, need to be, uh, a lot of this information is being translated into information that can be used by design professionals. It's very real, it's easy to understand, and you know, a great deal of focus should go into that area. Um, this is one example of how that information is used. 
I don't know if, if uh, many of you have had a chance to go on uh, Google Earth. Google Earth has a Hayward Fault virtual tour where it literally takes you along the fault. And it, uh, you know, the, the zone here is, you can see this is, you know, the typical Google Maps kind of information on either side, but this is what you get from these, these LIDAR images. And you can see this is obviously the University of California Memorial Stadium. Zoom in on that, you can find your, your, your season tickets, you know, where you're seated. And, you know, the alumni, the expensive section is the part that's not so good. Um, but we all know that, of course, it's under construction. And you can literally find your house, your school, your hospital, you know, and whatever building you might be interested in along that. So, you know, the question when I, when I bring this up is, is how can we use this? Because all of us, of course, would go to this, would, would understand, you know, and, and how do we get, um, you know, as, as Mary so, so perfectly put it, public engagement to use some of these tools uh, to understand earthquakes and understand our vulnerability and risk. Um, as I said, Alquist Priola Act, 1972, you know, we at least had the sense to say, look, you know, let's not build right directly on um, an earthquake. But what do you do with, you know, the, the 1972, look at, as I said, post-World War II, post-World War I, construction, 1930s and 40s construction, that's, that's right on the fault. Um, well, you know, the, the good thing about this is, is that we have the tools now to tell us what the vulnerability and the risk are to, to those older buildings. Um, some of the, the great technology and advancements that have happened since 95 is just the ability to, to map the hazards as well as to put those, those hazard maps into a form that are usable for the design professional and for the community. And, you know, there's a, a, a number of ways to get this information, liquefaction and landslide. You can go to CGS, you can go to USGS, a little bit more technological. I would like to put in a plug for the ABAG maps because they are very, very much um, um, created so that the average person can understand them. And, and they've, they've really done a good job. If you live in Oakland, you can type in Oakland, you can type in the 1906 earthquake, you can type in the Hayward Fault scenario that I'm talking about today and you can see what kind of ground shaking you could expect. And then even more important, you could type in the uh, 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and really start to understand that it wasn't, that wasn't the big one, which of course all of us are, are constantly um, fighting. So what do we have now? We have very, very accurate liquefaction maps, landslide maps. We have the ability to, to kind of hone in as, as both a design professional and a um, earthquake professional. And then of course as a homeowner, when you're starting to look or as a, as a building owner. Um, now, what do we need to take from this? Well, I have the privilege of going over in November to spend a week with the EQC, which I hope is still in business, uh, to look at single family residences, to look at you know, just exactly what happens to them in, under liquefaction. Because if you look at these areas of liquefaction, a lot of, of private buildings, a lot of commercial, a lot of residential, a lot of single family residential, well, you know, what do you tell a, a single-family residence owner in terms of liquefaction? Well, you've got to go back in, jack it up, and put in a, you know, a raft, a, a mat slab. Uh, obviously, that's not something they can afford. So we need to, to use this information to then create solutions. Um, great progress in the public sector. I've given this presentation a number of times, and I have to tell you I have had criticisms on both ends. You're too negative. You're too positive. So I want to make sure that I've got the, you know, the scales of justice here today and that I try and give you both the positive and the negative. Great progress in the public sector. East Bay Mud was just starting their program in 1995, $189 million. Their water system, they provide the water, clean water system and um, manage the sewage treatment plants for 1.2 million people. Their clean water comes from the Sierras, crosses the Hayward Fault in, in two very key places. So um, very important and very successful FEMA Best Practices um, Award, $189 million uh, retrofit. Um, where their water system crosses the Hayward Fault is, is in the region where Bar BART has a tunnel, where um, the Caldecott Tunnel, which has, I think, about 250,000 cars that go through it every day. Lots of things going on right there. Um, they were able to retrofit it, and then they recognized that they needed to build in a little extra safety, and they have valves on either side, and they have a kind of a, a patch that's able to go through so that they can start to restore clean water very quickly. An important thing to, to know here, though, is that while water is typically, you know, up here it's East Bay mud, 
different utilities throughout the state of California, sewage is actually monitored, or pardon me, is in the purview of the individual municipality. So if you live in Oakland, your sewer, sewers and all the pipes under this city are, are managed by the city of Oakland, Richmond, all, the, all, all of those. And so depending on what their budget is, depending on you know, how able they're able to get to that, will um, determine just exactly how long the disruption in the sewage treatment or in your, your ability to use the sanitary system after an earthquake. I do know that uh, my family owns a building in Berkeley. I went in to do a seismic retrofit. They made me uh, survey the, the sewage lines, the sewage sewer laterals. So I know that there are some cities that are, in fact, moving forward, but in these economic times, you know, we, we need to understand that when we're talking about sheltering in place, not only is clean water um, important, but obviously the ability, you know, to the, use the sanitation system is very important, and it's uh, spread out amongst many, many jurisdictions. San Francisco's water system also crosses the Hayward Fault. They're in the process of uh, embarking on a $4.3 billion retrofit program. Very important. They, they cross the fault down a little further south, but also affected by the potential 7.0 magnitude on the Hayward Fault. Now, BART also has made great, great strides. BART, um, their program, $980 million. They started with the stations. They moved to the elevated trackway. They, um, they figured that their trackway that's actually on soil or on ground uh, should do well, might have some minor track work that needs to be done. They recognized that that tunnel that I talk about, the, the tube that goes across the fault and, and by the Caldecott Tunnel, was um, economically uh, way too expensive to retrofit. And so they have, you know, mitigation, their mitigation plan essentially is kind of post-earthquake um, buses. But the rest of the system they are, in fact, working on, and um, they've made great progress. This is the East Oakland. Um, essentially this, there it is. This large concrete piece here is new, and, and then they've wrapped the columns. And um, that's the kind of work that they've done at, at uh, all of their stations. They also tore down their headquarters. It's always nice to move out of that non-ductile concrete frame building and have moved into a building that they expect to be able to use relatively shortly after an earthquake. Caltrans, also another um, public agency that, that, that has made great progress. Here in the Bay Area, we have, I think it's seven toll booths toll bridges, pardon me. Um, obviously, the, the big one is the $6 billion replacement of the um, Bay Bridge, or the eastern span of the Bay Bridge, but we also have to remember that they, they studied them all. We had a, a new span at Benicia. We had work done at San Rafael. We have a new span at, uh, help me out, which is the one with the C? <laughs> Carquinas. Um, uh, San Mateo, Dunbarton and Antioch were not originally included. They've done more studies, and, and if you notice that the toll went up, it's because they're going to do seismic retrofit on those. So those projects are, are very, very uh, much underway. This is called the, the maze, this area over here. You can see just about every freeway in the East Bay goes through here as well as BART, and um, the majority, uh, no, pardon me, all of these single columns have been evaluated and jacketed where needed. Um, they, despite the fact that all this work was done, ABAG study estimates there will be 1,734 closures. And you can understand that, you know, despite the fact that you retrofit all of these structures, you have um, highway on-ramps, you have, you know, approaches to elements that might be on soft soil, it might be on areas that shift. And those, so those closures, you know, are significant in terms of the ability to get around but they're not the catastrophic failures that they've addressed with this seismic retrofit program. So when I talk about you know, the scales here, we need to understand that closures will happen, but that a tremendous amount of work has, has been done in order to make these systems life safety, and in the case of the larger projects, to um, make them repairable after an earthquake. Bay Bridge replacement, as I mentioned, um, $6 billion. And, uh, gorgeous cable stay bridge that is very controversial, but in fact is going up. Port of Oakland manages both the Oakland Airport and the actual Marine Port. They had a significant amount of damage in, in 1989. Um, damage to uh, the tarmac and, and to the, the runways was, was significant. Some was paid by uh, the state, some was paid by the city of Oakland. If you ask the city of Oakland to come up with that money right now, they could not. So uh, they've undertaken $200 million retrofit of Terminal 1, which is the oldest one, a retrofit of Terminal 2, 
Um, and then they have done some work to, uh, you know, the, the runway and tarmac, but it, you can imagine how expensive it is to tear up a working, very busy airport and put in a new runway. So once again, we'll, we'll definitely have disruption at Oakland. Um, apparently San Jose and San Francisco are not expected to have as severe a disruption, but you can expect to have um, disruption and costly repairs to the runways in Oakland. They also manage, as I said, the marine port, and um, they have recently completed $11 million wharf and embankment retrofit program. Now, this is, once again, this is such a redundant and, and an expensive system to retrofit, but what they recognized is that, you know, to retrofit this, effectively, the embankment, is to, is to prevent you know, catastrophic collapse of a system that would then render the port unusable. So if you retrofit that and then, you know, look at the, the – um, and plan for what you will need to repair after the earthquake, um, that was the, the, the approach they took. So has everything been done here? No. And obviously we can expect um, disruption. And, and when we talk about disruption, I think, you know, today you heard over and over again the discussion of business interruption. You know, what happens with this is, you know, when you're one of these shipping lines, you know, you're not dedicated to the, the Port of Oakland. You go and you find somewhere else to deliver your goods. So when we talk about business interruption and disruption, it's extremely important to recognize the potential for impact on the economy when you have something this important that's disrupted. So is there work to, to, uh, to, to be done here? Absolutely. It's, now, since 1995, we've learned a great deal. Obviously, the Northridge earthquake, pardon me, um, the Kobe earthquake, and, of course, we, they just keep coming at us. We learn with each and every earthquake, and it, and it fortunately gets into our codes within, within a you know, certain time, sometimes quicker than other times. And so the new construction benefits greatly from these, these um, earthquakes and these, these um, opportunities to go and l learn from real-life earthquakes. But the buildings that don't necessarily get that benefit are existing buildings because there are no legal mandates, with the exception of hospitals and unreinforced buildings, that say for any category of building, unless you, you, you renovate it dramatically, that you have to go in and, and retrofit those buildings. So despite the great lessons learned, many, many, many of the, the structures and the buildings along the Hayward Fault that were built you know, you can, for many, you can pick a, a benchmark, but, you know, there's a great many that were built before the 1971 code, the 1979 code, are, are still extremely vulnerable. Um, power, telecommunications, fuel de delivery systems. Um, I think everybody needs to remember that PG&E is a private company. It reports to shareholders, and so you, you can't go on the PG&E website and just look up their seismic program. It is, in fact, confidential, but they do, in fact, um, you know, attend meetings, and they have a great deal of research and a lot of work that's going on. They've made a lot of progress, but you can imagine it's a very, um, uh, the system is, you know, snakes throughout the entire East Bay, and they will, in fact, have power outages. Um, and so essentially for, you know, all the systems that run through our backyards and, you know, into our houses, we can expect disruption. Um, I think it's, it's certainly better than 1995 because they've, they've approached some of the infrastructure, but we should expect um, disruption. Telecommunications, you know, you simply can't pick up a phone following an earthquake. We've seen that time and time again. However, with cellular networks, um, they do have the ability to roll in portable, um, uh, what, what would they be called, broadcasting? What are those things that go up on the towers? <laughs> they have the ability to, to, um, to bring in immediately um, systems that will help. Obviously, we'll have spotty reception. And then the first and foremost things that happens after an earthquake is just simply that the, that the lines are clogged because of overuse. So we should expect that, um, you know, for systems that absolutely rely on communications, like our fire, police, um, and, and health system, that they have other systems that are available to them, and they are, have made great strides in providing redundancy fuel delivery. For those of us who live in the Bay Area, we're very, very aware of what happened in San Bruno. And um, right now, of course, there's a great deal of attention that's uh, paid to the, the systems that run underneath the, the nine Bay Area counties and, um, you know, n not just in earthquakes, but obviously just in everyday weld failures. So um, very important systems. Is there work to be done there? Absolutely. I mean, just in locating the systems, I would say, absolutely. So once again, landlines will be down, cellular overloaded, and um, 
California website says long distance may be restored before local service. So if you put an emergency plan into action, one of the things that uh, works well is to have an out-of-state or out-of-area communication um, kind of node so that you communicate with a family member who lives outside. Um, so one of the things they, they talked about in 1995 was the fact that many of the EOCs, the emergency operating centers, were located in city halls, and many of the city halls were extremely vulnerable. Um, since then, the city of Albany, city of Berkeley, city of Oakland, city of Hayward, city of San Francisco have either retrofit or replaced or completely reconstructed and moved their city halls. Many of these are base isolated. Um, also, many of them have moved their EOCs out into structures that they expect can meet immediate occupancy. So a great amount of, of progress made in this particular area. Um, in terms of hospitals, many of you are familiar and have worked on SB 1953. SB 1953 was in progress in 1995, and they set what they considered were, you know, pretty reasonable dates, 2008, slipped to 2013, all acute care facilities must be life safe, 2030, all facilities must meet current code. Um, extremely expensive. We've seen hospitals go out of business, particularly here in the Bay Area. Um, we've made good strides, but you know, we're, 2013 is about, you know, what is it, 18 months off, and there's a lot of facilities that um, do not have the capital right now to replace. And yet we do have um, quite a few hospitals that uh, are moving in, and, and one of the, once again, the nice things about this, this Google, Google Hayward, pardon me, this Hayward Fault virtual tour is you can go in and you can click on hospital and you can immediately see, you know, where the hospitals are in the nine Bay Area counties and you can see that they're, they're very carefully placed, you know, within about 10 kilometers of the Hayward Fault and um, many of them on, on some of those nice liquefaction zones. So are they challenged? Absolutely. Are we making progress? Yes and no. Um, we, need to, we need to keep on that as earthquake professionals. Um, so once again, uh, the, the Google Earth Hayward Fault, I had to throw this in as a Cal grad. Um, once again, there's no excuse anymore to, to, to not know if you're on the fault or if you're in a fault zone. All that information is, is uh, easily accessible and not just to earthquake professionals. Okay, one area that we have made some progress but not great progress is in the area of K-12. K-12 is still voluntary. We had SB, what is it, AB 300, I have to get those straight, where um, essentially a group of, of very skilled professionals sat down with the drawings and um, looked at the potential for, for collapse in, in schools. And so it's a very narrow perspective on these buildings and came up with a list. They essentially they sent a letter to the district and said, you might have a problem. Well, um, schools barely have money for um, academics, let alone uh, athletics, art, music, and seismic retrofit. So one of the cities that actually has made great progress is the city of Berkeley. This uh, is a replacement school for one that was on the fault. West Contra Costa has, has uh, just about completed a seismic retrofit program, but many of the cities have not. I just spent 11 years with the city of Piedmont, 11,000 people, reasonably well-educated group, 11 years, $60 million. It took me about 11 years to convince them to retrofit their one-story wood frame buildings. And that was because we need to stop talking about collapse and start talking about what you want the buildings to do after an earthquake. And I'll tell you that kids wake up the next day after an earthquake and they don't, you know, they don't talk about resiliency. They say what's for breakfast. And so we need to be able to send them to school as soon as we can and get um, the community back up and running. So a great de deal of work needs to be done here. Um, on the university side, University of California Safer Program, community colleges, uh, California state system have made progress but are not yet finished. In terms of response, um, we have a little competition going on since 9-11 with uh, terrorism. I think all of you have, have experienced that. USG, what is it, FEMA was absorbed by the NHS. Um, so we're competing for dollars, we're competing for attention. But one of the good things that happened is they said, look, in order to qualify for federal funds after an earthquake, you have to have a plan. You know, so it's at least a start. And the other thing is that they have a federal plan, a state plan, and then plans below that that all annex off of each other and are very well coordinated. So um, we're starting to make efforts. But I will tell you there are agencies that have a plan, and that's it. You know, they have no funds to act on that plan. So um, definitely work that needs to happen in that area. Regional coordination plan. And then we get to, you know, what Mary was talking about. What do we want the East Bay to look like? 
They're talking about 80,000 people needing shelter in the city of Oakland alone after the 7.0 earthquake. This is a Hurricane Katrina. I don't think that we, well, we have a basketball court at, I don't know what it's called now, at the arena. But, you know, this is not what we're looking at when we talk about the ability to be resilient. Because the majority of these people right here are, um, they're seniors. They're uh, people who are economically disadvantaged. They're people for whom English is a second language. And re recovery for them is extremely difficult. And so I say let's mitigate beforehand. Housing and social recovery, on the left is your soft story, on the right is your soft story. What's the difference? One is multifamily, one is single family. I have the privilege of working on this issue with single family, and I will tell you that, that I have some funding, and I have a tremendous amount of energy, and, and I'm committed to it. Um, but in order to shelter in place, you know, these are private buildings. Where does the funding come from? Where, where, who, who's responsible for this? Is there any public responsibility for multifamily housing, particularly if they're economically challenged people living in it? Soft story ordinances, we have one mandatory ordinance and then we have um, a number of, of cities that have either done uh, a survey and some have even come up with that you need to survey your building. But it's a huge problem, it's, it's a huge part of that shelter in place and it, it is not anywhere near. Fire following earthquake, um, uh, Charlie was very helpful in putting this together. I think it's, uh, what is it, 1.8 trillion dollars in terms of real estate at risk, some of it interfacing with, with uh, wildlands. You can imagine if we had a day like we did in um, 1991 with wind and, um, you know, if it happened up, you know, Hayward Fault backs right up to Tilden and Redwood and all of that um, has the potential for a serious conflagration. And unlike uh, the 1991 firestorm, um, uh, how many of those people are, are self-insured? I like that phrase. Uh, these people were not self-insured. These people predominantly had fire insurance, and um, actually many of these people were, were able to move into um, housing that night. Not a lot of need for, for public housing. A little different when you start to talk about the people who live in the nine Bay Area counties. Economic loss ratio, RMS, um, came up with commercial and residential building losses. This is a huge area for study. I'm going to, I call it my number two priority, and it's, and it's exactly what kind of damage ratio do we have in housing. Um, we don't know that yet, but when I start to talk about a 15% deductible, I'd like to know, are you going to experience 50% damage or are you going to experience 14% damage? Very important, huge area of research, and um, I can sit that, could sit that night, my number one. So here's, here's the crux of it right here, $186.3 billion in building damage, building and infrastructure damage. We're not talking about um, business interruption here. We're not talking about the loss to the economy or to people who move out and don't come back. And in residential, $6 billion of that insured, $15.9 billion in commercial insured. So the majority of our, of our, our private building owners are um, self-insured, uh, the majority in Alameda County. So what is my call to action? As the chief mitigation officer, uh, my job is to implement a mitigation program. We have a budget that is not accessible by the state of California. It's private. But my responsibility is to the public, both insured and uninsured. I hope to roll out the program at the first of the year where we, we give financial um, incentives to homeowners to retrofit their homes. But beyond that, my job is research. My, my job is education. And so, um, and the, the cool thing is it's about damage and it's about residences. And so when we talk about a resilient community, um, you know, we have some resiliency along the Hayward Fault. We have a long way to go. Great opportunities for research. I look forward to working with many of you. And if you have a chance to look at this, you'll get a lot more detail. And, um, but I, I, um, I do encourage you to, to think of your area for those of you who aren't in the Hayward Fault because this scenario is likely to be very similar. And I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you.